I've been doing some cutting lately on opals that we found in Finding Gold 6 and Finding Gold 7. If you want to learn how to find them, that's where you need to go on YouTube to the Finding Gold series and look up number 6 and 7. This particular opal, 13 millimeters, it will be one of the largest opals cut in this pattern. This is the Pharaoh's Eye. It is from a very, very old design that first appeared in Gems of the World. In 1999 it was re-engineered by Fred Van Sant and the original eye, no doubt, probably came from another design. Just as I have taken the Cleopatra's eye and redesigned that into the all-seeing eye. Well, why am I cutting so many eyes? What I'm trying to get ready to do is cut a uh, large piece of opal. And this opal will be cut into four individual eyes. I'll spray it so you can see it a little better. And you can see the sections that I'll use to make the four large eyes that will come from this piece. They'll be some of the largest ever produced. Now in the Pharaoh's eye as given, it's for a refractive index of 1.7, that's sapphire. And I'm doing an opal, so I had to change some of the angles because we have large swaths where we'd simply light would pass straight through the stone with no reflection at all and we'd have what is known as a dead stone. So some of these angles have to be changed, which means that other angles have to be changed. Be that as it may, the Pharaoh's eye is going to be a pattern rejiggered from Fred Van Sant, who also redid this from another pattern of Gems of the World. The Cleopatra's eye I totally redid and so that it would fit and make into the all-seeing eye. I'm telling you this because we get a lot of questions on gems, especially lately with the economy going down and uh, people are, are looking for things to do. We've taken a natural opal found in Oregon or maybe on the Oregon-Nevada line um, in Finding Gold 6 and Finding Gold 7. I pick up so many of them I can't really tell you for sure at this point where this one exactly was found. And we're going to take this rock that's worth maybe maybe fifteen dollars and we're going to turn it into an eye worth hundreds of dollars. Now this is capitalism at its best, where we take something that's worth this, we add value to it, and we sell it over here for hundreds of dollars. What's in between is wealth creation. That's money that is created. The government didn't create it. We created it by making something out of virtually nothing. There are some pitfalls, however. Go to eBay and look for um, sapphires. And you'll see a lot of sapphires that are selling for a dollar a piece. These are the sapphires that are coming from China, Burma, India, the uh, cutting whorehouses there. And they're dumping gems on the market. They aren't real, of course, but they shine. How could I tell any of these real gems from theirs? Well, the truth is I couldn't, not without a spectroscope. 
and the public can't either. And what they're doing by dumping their gemstones on the market is they're ruining the one thing that it takes to sell high quality jewelry or gems, and that is trust. Without trust, how do we know if any of these are real opals or just pieces of glass? We don't. So if people can't tell whether this is a piece of glass or a sunstone or if this is a uh, Montana sapphire or another piece of glass, what do you do? Well, in the early days, you know, people come to us now, we're kids, kind of an enviable position. But uh, what we did and what we still do is uh, we give a certificate of authenticity. Now we find these gems, so there's no question where they come from. We also, and we still do, give them a 30 day money back guarantee. That gives them time to get to their jeweler or uh, GIA expert or whatever it is to authenticate the stone to their satisfaction. And I think it's wise for you to think about these things and do the same thing yourself because trust has to be established some way with uh, the markets being what they are with the just flooding of uh, cheap importation stones, uh, most of which are imitation um, and just uh, very close to 100%. Now let's get back to cutting those eyeballs. I mentioned all that to you so you know there's a lot more to this than simply buying machine and a stone that you might not know is real or not real and expecting that machine to cut it and sell it for you. Now we took our opal that's on the stick now that you just saw and went through these steps. We looked at the stone. We looked for the cracks. This whole side is going to have to be cut out. That means that I'm going to position my dop right here to get the deepest part of the stone so I'm going to flip that over and I'm going to put that dop stick right about there. I also have to align it. And I know that the flat part will align so that the corners of the eyes are right here, giving me the largest amount of stone. We have to think of all those things. And as we're cutting, we're going to have to cut very carefully around these cracks to leave as much stone as is possible. Now I've already done that on the stone that you've seen. I've glued it onto the dop stick with nothing more than super glue control gel. And what I'm doing is I'm cutting these two cuts on each side, four cuts in total, that make up the corner of the eyeball. So when you look at it, this is looking out the top, you'll see this plane. This is what I'm working on now, are these corners right here. That's on the pavilion right here. And here are these two cuts, the corner of the eyeball. They're going to be shining at you. See that? And we're cutting them down right to the center point. Now you see this dial indicator? As I bring the stone down and get nearer and nearer the cut, it's going to come to zero. I'm simply using the dial indicator. I'm not using any kind of stop. Now the, the dial is simply a guide at this point. What I'm doing is cutting and looking. We are just about there. Now 
The only way to get a perfect gem is to eyeball it. Well, I'm going to continue to cut before this final film for a while. I wanted to give you the best advice I could if you decide to do this. I'm going in for some throat surgery and uh, so I probably won't be making films for a while, maybe quite some time. And if that's the case, good luck to you and whatever you decide to do. And if you ever wonder who the old couple is up there at 12,000 feet picking up rocks, well that's probably the missus and myself. Good luck with your prospecting. Good luck with fastening.